Afterward, Paul felt compelled by the Spirit to go over to Macedonia and Achaia before returning to Jerusalem. And, and after that, he said, I must go on to Rome. So he sent his two assistants, Timothy and Erastus, ahead to Macedonia while he stayed a while longer in the province of Asia. Now about that time, serious trouble developed in Ephesus concerning the way. And it began with Demetrius, a silversmith, who had a large business manufacturing silver shrines of the Greek goddess Artemis. And he kept many craftsmen busy. He called them all together, along with others employed in similar trades, and addressed them as follows. <laughs> Gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this business. But as you have seen and heard, this man Paul has persuaded many people that handmade gods aren't really gods at all. And he's done this not only here in Ephesus, but throughout the entire province. Of course, I'm not just talking about the loss of public respect for this business. I'm also concerned that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will lose its influence and that Artemis that magnificent goddess worshipped throughout the province of Asia and all of the world will be robbed of her great prestige. At this, their anger boiled and they began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! And soon the whole city was filled with confusion and everyone rushed to the amphitheater dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus who were Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. And Paul wanted to go in too, but his believers wouldn't let him. Some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, also sent a message to him, begging him not to risk his life by entering the amphitheater. Now inside, the people were all shouting some one thing and one the other, and everything was in confusion. In fact, most of them didn't even know why they were there. And the Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander forward and told him to explain the situation. And, and he motioned for everyone to be silent, and he tried to speak. But when the crowd realized that he was a Jew, they started shouting again, and they kept it up for two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! At last, the mayor was able to quiet them down enough to speak. Citizens of Ephesus, he said, Everyone knows that Ephesus is the official guardian of the temple of the great Artemis, whose image fell down to us from heaven. Now, since this is an undeniable fact, you should stay calm and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, but they have stolen nothing from the temple and have not spoken against our goddess. If, if Demetrius and the craftsmen have a case against them, the courts are in session, and the officials can hear the case at once. Let them make formal charges. And if there are complaints about other matters, they can be settled in the legal assembly. I am afraid that we are in danger of being charged with rioting by the Roman government. And uh, if Rome demands an explanation, we won't know what to say. So then he dismissed them, and they dispersed. May God add his understanding to the message today. Amen. Well, good morning, folks. Great to see everybody this morning. Welcome to KCC. Uh, just a couple of things I'm going to take care of first, Pastor Leslie, and then we'll get to you. Uh, but keep that microphone handy. I think I see somebody I haven't seen for a long time, Tyler Lawrence. Welcome. Tyler grew up in Kent Covenant, and I understand you're married now, is that right? Would you like to introduce your wife to us? All right, let's celebrate with these guys. Yeah, great, Tyler. Great to see you and Jennifer. Yeah, and uh, I didn't catch it before the uh, dedication, but Heather, I think I saw your two brothers, Stephen and Eric here, and Eric's got his family. Welcome back, you guys. This family goes way back in the history of Kent Covenant. Uh, Heather's parents, Paul and Lynn Bupp, were very much part of this church. They've gone home to the Lord now. But it's always fun to see uh, other family members when you're able to come 
and, uh, and be here. So a uh, great day for your family. Wonderful. Well, um, I just want to say one more time, if you're, if you're new to Cat Covenant and, you know, maybe you've been here for a year or so, and we just let you be the judge of that, we'd love it if you would come to Pasta with the Pastors, all right? That's uh, going to be right after this service, start about 12.15, it's only going to last an hour, and uh, it'll be a good time. You can meet all the pastors in one place. You don't get that on Sunday morning, do you? Because we're all running around doing different things. So this is your opportunity, and if you got kids, bring them along. We've got child care set up, and they can eat first and then head to the child care, and it's going to be a good time, okay? So we'd love it if you would uh, join us. And then, Pastor Leslie, I want to just give a little shout-out for what I thought was a great message last week. And uh, thanks for that. You, you have a really wonderful way of taking these kind of big, you know, biblical truths and, uh, and, and showing them how they apply to our lives, showing us, and, and really opening up your own life in the process. And so thanks. That was, that was really awesome and, and uh, excellent. So thank you. Okay, now I'm going to make Pastor Leslie do a little bit of work. I want to start out with a question, okay? I want you to think about this for a minute, all right? Okay, here's the question. When is the last time that being a Christian or, you know, doing something in your Christian faith that reflected your faithfulness to Jesus' teaching got you in trouble? When did you get in trouble for living out your Christian faith? Okay, now I'm not saying you got thrown in jail. Maybe somebody did. But just you got in trouble with somebody. Somebody didn't like it. And, you know, you faced something as a result of that. Let's see some hands. And we love it when it's all over the sanctuary, you know, because then Pastor Leslie really has to work and get a little extra exercise. Come on, who's got a story of, uh, of some time you lived out your faith in some way and it got you in trouble? All right, right here in front. Yeah, uh, I, being in recovery for 21 years of alcohol, I have been uh, basically criticized by some of my family and some of the members of of AA by saying, why do you talk about Jesus? Well, the only answer I can tell them is that Jesus got me sober, he's kept me sober, and he always will. Amen. Let's hear it for 21 years of sobriety. All right. And it's all about Jesus, all right? And you get some pushback sometimes. Yeah, good. Somebody else? Anybody else got a story? Don't be shy. All right. One more over here. When I was in middle school, I was in uh, gym class. Uh, me and one of my, uh, my friends who was a Muslim had paired up. Um, and I was standing there. I thought I was just looking around um, until she started shouting at me. And walking away she was very irate um and so i turned and asked one of my other friends who was at the station over from us what had happened and she told me that i had just told my muslim friend about god and jesus and the salvation story so um i realized that god must have um, used me to tell her um, um about the salvation she could have through him um, and that was a wow moment for me. Great. Well, good for you. That's wonderful that you shared that. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Good. Anybody else? We have, we have time for one more. If somebody else, we got, yeah, I like this. Other side of the sanctuary, Pastor Leslie. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, growing up, I had two sets of friends, the, sets I, the set I had here and the set at school who were widely non-believers. And I had to be pretty careful on keeping, one, keeping those sets apart because I wouldn't want uh, my church friends to think my school friends were ins influencing me negatively, and two, keeping how I lived my life so my school friends would know that mm. uh, I was a Christian. Mm -hmm. It cost me a few friends. Yeah, because they didn't like that you were so faithful to Christ and they could see that in the yeah. way that you lived. 
Yeah, all right, good story, good story. Yeah, thank you, Kelsey. All right, that's probably, that's probably good enough here. Um, so we're continuing our series in the book of Acts today, and you know, we've been calling it, uh, I will build my church. That's a statement that Jesus made. Uh, and we've been looking at how Jesus is building his church. And you know, in every generation and in every age, Jesus is continuing to build his church. And he's not quite done yet building his church. And when that day comes, Christ will return. But the building of the church continues on. And um, it's really great to open up the book of Acts and see what the purposes and priorities of the early church were. Because you know something? The purposes and priorities of the church do not change from generation to generation. What changes are the tactics and the strategies. How do we reach this world around us with the good news of Jesus? That's tactics, that's strategies. But the purpose of the church, the priorities of the church, remain the same from generation to to generation. Now, I want you to listen to how this story from Acts 19 starts out, okay? Listen to this. It says, serious trouble developed in Ephesus concerning the way. Did you know that the early church and early Christians were referred to as the way? The way. It was kind of short for the way of life. And it was a way of saying, you know, this isn't just some shallow intellectual kind of a, a commitment. This is a whole way of life. And these people have set themselves apart. They have distinguished themselves from others by what's important to them and by the way that they live. See, if following Christ had little or no impact on day-to-day -day life, then there would not have been the kind of trouble we read about in Ephesus in this situation. This trouble erupted because Christ's followers were living in such a thoroughly countercultural way, counterculture to Ephesus. And what we discover here is that following Christ can get you in trouble. That's true, isn't it? Following Christ can get you into some trouble in this world, especially if we are faithful to the actual teachings of Jesus. It's just as true in our time. There are ways that Jesus' teachings represent a direct challenge, even a direct assault sometimes, on the accepted norms and values of the American way of life. This morning, I want to offer a couple of examples of ways the good news challenged commonly accepted values in the ancient city of Ephesus, and I want us to think deeply about what they mean for us in our time. Now, Ephesus, you may know, is a place where the Apostle Paul invested a lot of his life, spent a lot of time there, like three years. And when it was time for him to finally leave, you know, we read about this very intense, tear-filled goodbye that he received from the church and from the leaders in Ephesus. So first of all, I want us to see that the good news speaks the truth to power in every age, and here is the first way that took place in Ephesus, in the area of business and economics. By business, I mean the exchange of goods and services for money or for other goods and services, something that goes on in every society, something that is foundational to what society is all about. Folks, Christianity turned the economic structure of the ancient city of Ephesus right on its head. A lot of the business in Ephesus was tied to the great deity Artemis. She's mentioned throughout this, the goddess of the hunt. That was her name in the Greek world, okay? She was a, a multi-breasted figure. Uh, in Rome, she was known as Diana. They worshipped her a little bit differently, but the goddess of the hunt. When I was growing up, the first dog I remember us having when we got like four or five years old was a beautiful black lab. It was a great hunting dog, and she was named Diana. Good name for a hunting dog, all right? So with Artemis, the idea was that her original form, you know, had fallen from heaven. That's what they thought. Some people think it was a meteor, but in any case... Um, that was their understanding about Artemis. 
And uh, there was this great temple to Artemis uh, in Ephesus because Ephesus was the central capital for the worship of Artemis. And it was considered to be, this one, by the way, exists right now in Istanbul, Turkey. But uh, this great uh, structure was considered to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So you understand the special place that Artemis had in the hearts of the people in Ephesus. Well, as the Christian movement spread, Christians stopped buying little silver statues of Artemis to use in worship rituals and prayers. They didn't need them anymore, and they didn't want them. That put a severe dent in the silver manufacturing business. A big shot silver tycoon by the name of Demetrius got his fellow silversmiths together and some other business leaders, and he said, hey, this Christianity thing is eroding our business. We got to do something to stop it. Listen to verses 26 and 27 of Acts chapter 19. Gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this business, but as you have seen and heard, this man Paul persuaded many people that handmade gods aren't really gods at all. And he's done this not only here in Ephesus, but throughout the entire province. One of the important lessons we learn from this is that our faith is meant to impact our business and our buying decisions. And I think we usually only talk about that from a stewardship point of view, being good stewards of what God has given us. But it goes beyond that. It also impacts the issue of values. We are absolutely right to ask, what exactly am I buying into when I get this really cool object, whatever it is, this shirt, this pair of shoes, this cup of coffee even? What am I participating in? And that covers everything from the way it may influence our behavior and that of others to things like its impact on creation to manufacture it, this world God gave us to steward and take care of. And it also includes how was it made and how were the people treated in the process as it was made. Did they work in safe conditions? Were they paid a fair living wage and treated justly. You see, if the answer is no, it was made by, you know, some 10-year-old children in a third world sweatshop. And uh, the industry out of which this comes is one of the worst polluters on the face of the earth. Then that purchase is not right for us, is it? See, we can't just say, well, that's not my problem. I'm, I'm not responsible for how some third world country treats its people or how some other governments show no respect for creation. Folks, God does not want his children in one part of the world to participate in commerce that exploits people in another part of the world or that treats this beautiful, marvelous world God gave us to take care of as an object just to be used and abused. Every time we buy something, we enter into the process that made it. As followers of Christ, we're here to have a helpful impact in the lives of others, a renewing, replenishing impact in this world God gave us to live in. We're called to do things that make the lives of the exploited and the marginalized better. Remember Jesus' great commandment. What did he say? Love your neighbor as yourself. How would you like to be treated? And remember in that beautiful picture of the, of the great judgment, you know, in Matthew 25, Jesus says, whatever you have done for the least of these, my brethren, you've done for me, and whatever you have failed to do for the least of these, you failed to do for me willingly participating in unfair or unjust economic structures is not living up to what the Christian commitment is all about. 
just as we should want to know about the quality of the food that we put inside our bodies. We should care about the conditions under which things were made. The Bible is full of warnings to the people of God about not being involved in practices that take advantage of others to improve something about their own lives. We can start with Amos chapter 4. I want you to listen to these words of Amos 4 in which God was taking the wealthy of Israel to task for the fact that they were exploiting poor people in order to live in luxury. This is Amos 4. Listen to me, you fat cows living in Samaria, you women who oppress the poor and crush the needy and who are always calling to your husbands, bring us another drink. The sovereign Lord has sworn by his holiness the time will come when you will be led away with hooks in your noses. Every last one of you will be dragged away like a fish on a hook. You will be led through the ruins of the wall. You will be thrown from your fortresses, says the Lord. It's not a pretty picture of judgment, is it? But what it's talking about is people living a life of luxury on the backs of others who are suffering and who are exploited. And it's a warning that God wants none of that among his people. The good news also challenged the existing order, spoke truth to power in the area of religion and patriotism. Religion and patriotism. Now, folks, I want to say it's always a danger to combine these two into one, and yet it still happens. Our own society is not exempt. Faith in God through Christ is one kind of commitment. Citizenship in a country like the United States or Canada or Russia or China or Bangladesh is another kind of commitment. The entire time Paul preached throughout the ancient world, he retained his citizenship in the Roman Empire, didn't he? He never renounced that. As a matter of fact, he leveraged it sometimes to help him in his ministry. Sometimes when, you know, they were about ready to beat him to death, he said, hey, I'm a Roman citizen. I have certain rights that you have to respect and you have to honor. And yet, he never confused the two kingdoms, did he? He never acted as if his Roman citizenship was equal to, in importance, his citizenship in the kingdom of God. In our time, national citizenship can and should give us some leverage to make our country a more fair and a more just society. Isn't that what we hope for through voting in elections, joining political parties, running for office, advocating for righteous causes? But Christian commitment is centered in the idea that our loyalty to the kingdom of God is greater than our loyalty to our country of citizenship. Folks, when we reverse that, it is disastrous for our faith. The kind of total commitment Jesus called for requires us to put loyalty to him above all other loyalties. It really does. And the example that he used so powerfully was loyalty to family. Do you remember him saying this? If you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else, your father, your mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. What's he talking about? Well, allowing for some hyperbole, which in those days was a way of making a point in a very emphatic way, he is saying your commitment to family has to pale in comparison to your commitment to me, which towers above all other commitments in life. That's what he's saying. All right, notice the appeal Demetrius made to his fellow silversmiths. It dangerously fused worship of Artemis religion, with loyalty to Ephesus, patriotism. Okay, these verses continue on, the speech of Demetrius. Referring to Paul, he's done this not only here in Ephesus, but throughout the entire province. Of course, I'm not just talking about the loss of public respect for our business. I'm also concerned that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will lose its influence, and that Artemis, this magnificent goddess, worshipped throughout the province of Asia, 
and all around the world will be robbed of her great prestige. What's Demetrius saying? He's saying it's not only our business that is in jeopardy here because of the Christian message, because of what the Apostle Paul has been preaching. It's our identity. It's who we are as citizens of Ephesus and this whole region. In Ephesus, we worship Artemis, and we're proud of that. And you know what he's thinking? Take your Jesus and go back to Israel. This is Artemis country. Folks, when it comes to religion and patriotism, sometimes people still try to fuse the two into one. There are people in our time who don't know the difference between the meaning of the stars and stripes, a marvelous symbol of our national life in America. They don't know the difference between that and the cross, this powerful symbol of what our faith is all about. I'm not saying that a nation cannot be blessed by God. That's something we should all want. That's something we should all pray for. But I am saying none of us can equate our national citizenship or loyalty to national citizenship with loyalty to God and his kingdom. That's what I'm saying. And sadly, we have groups that distort this horribly. Groups like the KKK and the skinheads and the neo-Nazis and white supremacists twist and distort, distort biblical teaching and then weave them into their own homegrown version of patriotism. And they wreak havoc on everybody around them who doesn't look and think and act the way that they do. And folks, we've grown familiar with this in another situation too. Terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS do the same thing with Islam. That's why ISIS is so desperate to have a caliphate. Because of the way they're merging their religion and patriotism. Christians, in whatever countries we reside, understand that we live in two separate kingdoms at once. That's what the Bible teaches the most important is the eternal, invisible kingdom of God where Christ calls us to serve the rest of humanity as he did. The secondary one is a visible geographic political entity that exists at a point in history and for a period of time. And I just want you to remember this because it, it just makes the point so clearly and puts it in bold relief. Do you remember that Jesus stood in front of Pilate and Pilate demanded to know if he was a king? Do you remember what Jesus said? He said, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus knew the difference and conscientiously lived it out, refusing to take up the sword to defend his cause. This story in Ephesus shows us the danger of what happens when religion and patriotism get fused into the same cause. Listen to this. Verse 28, at this their anger boiled. What, what uh, Demetrius just said. At this their anger boiled, and they began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Soon the whole city was filled with confusion. Everyone rushed to the amphitheater, dragging Gaius and Aristarchus, who were Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Paul wanted to jump in on it too. He wanted to jump in because he saw an opportunity to preach the gospel one more way and one more time without much regard for his own life. But it says the believers and province officials. And, you, you know, I, I, this is not really further explained, but I think some of these province officials were probably friends of Paul's even before he preached the good news because Tarsus was not all that way, far away from Ephesus where this occurred. Verse 32, inside the people were all shouting, some one thing, some another. Everything was in confusion. In fact, most of them didn't even know why they were there. You know what happens when mob violence takes control 
of a crowd. People who don't feel strongly about whatever the original issue was or even know what the commotion is all about jump into the fray. And folks, we still see this today. We see it every year in, on May Day in Seattle. It's the riot mentality. And it even says there was a backlash against the Jews. And I don't think the crowd could really distinguish between the two because they were thinking, well, Jewish Judaism, that's a foreign religion, you know, and they don't buy our little statutes. And it says, this shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And, uh, you know, this crowd at the boiling point went on for two hours. It took the city's mayor to calm the crowd by appealing to them to cool down. You know, you would have thought maybe the mayor would get swept up in this fervor about the greatness of Ephesians and wanting to get rid of all these foreigners. But he didn't. Pointed out that no attacks had been made by Christians on the temple of Artemis. See, we learned some things about how to conduct ourselves. No shrines had been stolen or vandalized. No laws of, Ephe of Ephesus had been broken, and if the silversmiths really had charges they wanted to bring, they could take them up in the law courts. But of course, they didn't want to take them up in the law courts. They wanted to do it by mob violence. Paul and his companions pursued their cause peacefully and respectfully. It was the Christian message. Not the messengers. It was the Christian message that was challenging the existing order, the business interests of Ephesus, and the Christian good news that was speaking the truth to power. The good news, by its nature, always speaks the truth to power. Amen. Let's pray together.